What? You use Facebook? I, lots of people use Facebook. I've been s walking around the aisles watching people use their Facebook while they're listening to the lectures. So, but even the, e clearly even for people who don't use Facebook, I think there's a market for the Freedom Box, right? The Freedom Box. You clearly missed the big lecture this morning. Adam, I mean, Evan, Eben Moglins talk this morning was, I thought it was pretty interesting. I'm curious, I guess there's going to be a BOF about, the, about that that's getting scheduled right now that I'm supposed to make an announcement about later on tonight. And um, I guess there's, I mean, who, who's, show of hands, who's interested in, who, okay, two questions. Who's interested in owning such a thing? All right, that's pretty good. Who's interested in developing for such a thing? That's cool. Yeah, okay. For those who don't know, basically the whole focus of the talk this morning was a proposal for this device called the Freedom Box, which is essentially a, a server in a small embedded device that you plug in in your home, and it serves all of your whatever information you want to be public in the world. So for instance, your homepage, your you know, op free Facebook equivalent social networking sort of thing. Uh, it serves as a network proxy, um, uh, telephony, which was actually what this talk was supposed to be about, and um, privately owned router, right. So something that would be running completely free software on a embedded device that you would plug in in your home and it would own all of your data, would control all of your data and how it, that data is distributed on the network. And then also act potentially, I mean, in um, Professor Moglin's dream as, you know, a proxy for other people and, you know, Tor router or whatever. Consumer friendly, dead simple. And his, it, I, I thought the talk was interesting, was very interesting, because he had such a concrete proposal about what to do. And the point was that it, you know, would exist on, it, you know, hardware that currently exists right now, and, you know, with built, uh, operating system built with stuff that we already have, like Debian. So. Well, it would be, well, it would be dead simple to the, the idea is that it would be dead simple to the user, but it needs, you know, however many hundreds of smart, well, the idea is that it wouldn't need a system administrator. That's the hope. That's the ideal. It's just a, that a box that you would just plug into the wall and it would just work. I mean, clearly that needs a lot of work for that to happen because they're, they're, that sort of thing just doesn't even exist. All the things that claim to do that, clearly don't do that. Like your, you know, your home, well, I think the thing that's closest to that is your home router, your home gateway without Wi-Fi. Those things generally just work, I would say. But as soon as you add Wi-Fi, then they, they stop working. Yeah, here, here's a microphone. Has Mr. Sugar showed up yet? No, okay. I'm going to keep ranting on this then. Does anyone know if the chipset in those uh, those boxes? I think he was. Uh, by the way, I think the hardware that he was uh, referring to is probably the Guru plug. That's what right. it sounded like. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Does anyone know if that chipset supports host AP yet, though? It supports what? So that it can be an access point. Because a lot of the chipsets yeah, those, still the, don't those support things, that, right? Those things are access points out of the box, I believe. Oh, okay. Right? Somebody. There are people who own Guru plugs around here, aren't there? They have Bluetooth and wireless. Hello. Uh, I work with these devices and on the ARM side. Yeah. And uh, there's the Guru plug. The first one didn't have wireless. Then now they're shipping. Uh, uh, they call it was the Shiva plug without wireless. Then there's the Guru plug. It has wireless. 
These devices is, are based on ARM v5 instruction set. It doesn't do uh, much graphics. And there are a lot of uh, devices coming up, like uh, Effica MX boards. Also, uh, they are based on ARM v7 instruction sets. They can do multimedia and have Wi-Fi. And you have uh, all, all the software from Debian to, to make an access point to, to have your server at home or, or do whatever you, you like. I mean, I've been running a system which is used for Debian build DDs at home. And I have my my server there with my IRC connected, have my website, my my documents, and I, I can use it as as I want. And, and this is uh, this is not uh, for me. It's not new. You could do this for like three, four years, and now there are more. There's this plug computing, and there's like a hype on on these devices. And I mean, I think it's this is great. Yeah, I think that. Probably most Debian people, I mean, I'm sure everybody, most people in the room, like, maintain servers in their room. So, I mean, it, I mean, he actually mentioned that, that most of us probably already do basically what he was talking about ourselves, but the idea is to make it something that's dead simple that anybody could just use and plug in. And so, the, clearly, the challenge there is not the... Um, since I'm being the speaker now. Um, it's clearly, clearly since the, the idea is, I mean, clearly the challenge is to make the actual thing that's going to run on the device, not the device itself, since that's, that's done, obviously. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just met a gentleman uh, next door. He's working on a project called Linaro, L-I-N-A-R-O. He showed it to me. And what they want to do is they want to coalesce all development efforts regarding the ARM platform, uh, providing APIs, uh, everything so that everything from Mimeo and uh, um, Android, everything can be, can, can be found there in one place, making, coalescing all APIs and making development on the ARM um, very easy, in other words. So that could be something that, that could be used with this project to move forward towards yeah. the, uh, the project that uh, he was talking this about this morning. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it sounds to me like what he's really asking us to do is to make a Debian, uh, essentially a spin-off distribution, where you, you make a installable thing that you just can load into one of these devices and it just works. Something like Ubuntu, where it's you, you get a core, not just a core set of packages, but also all the way up through the very top, such that you know, you've got all of the components already there, already installed when you put the image onto the device. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a complete spin-off. You just have to have enough meta packages and a way of putting those together as a, as a, uh, as a bootstrap right, environment. A so you can do it with the, um, uh, the multi-strap that we've been looking at right. already for th this kind of thing. You just select the packages you want right. and you put them together. You, put, you give it its own configuration and you have a tarball at the end. Rick, you don't... We even have a name for that. It's called uh, Debian Pure Blends. Yes. Well, actually, Neil, you're you're actually the seem like the person person the content. I mean, you you're the one who's been organizing the Debian yeah. stuff, right? So, yeah. I mean, is that how how close is that to being able to provide? Well, how close is that being able to provide a, a system that'll just run? It is in it, it is in commercial production today. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. But the, clearly, we still need the integrated. Um, experience of having the pre-configured service, services and stuff that would run in the system. Yeah, go ahead. Um, about six years ago, I bought a machine called a ReadyNAS, um, and that company was bought by Netgear, and it came pre-installed with a version of Debian for um, like home file storage, and it was pretty much, it was pretty much what we're talking about. Um, you know, you bought the machine, it was pre-installed with Debian, they gave you the root password. Um, if you wanted to install anything else, uh, I don't think it was an Intel architecture either. I think it was something strange. Spark. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Spark. It's a Spark architecture, and um, uh, I think that the the way that they had that set up, um, you know, was is like a proven business model, and that um, there's probably room for lots of small companies all around the world to do a similar thing, um, 
and these the, the kind of Shiva plug computers are very low, you know, with ARM are pretty powerful for the given that they're the size of a power supply. But I think that yeah, you know, lots of people have got old computers sticking around that they could use for doing this kind of thing. Um, and so I think the idea of it being one specific um, like Shiva plug thing isn't that relevant. I mean, if if the packages are in Debian. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that the particular, I agree with you, I think the particular hardware implementation is not as important as the, the software yeah. stack, the, the operating system or whatever you want to call it that gets installed on the thing and having that be a unified top to bottom thing that works. Yeah, and, and installing these things is something that small companies can copy the ready NAS model and, and do locally. So, so the next step seems to be, to me, kind of figuring out what stuff, what is in that stack, right? So clearly... Well, do, do, you, do you guys know about the Diaspora project? He mentioned it. I mean, you might have, anybody, raise your hand if you heard of this. So this, this project, I'll, I'll give a very brief overview of what, what happened. So this project actually spun off of the, the lecture that he gave on this topic in February. And it, um, just four NYU kids decided they were going to basically try to implement a social, the social networking component of what he, was, what he was talking about. And they started a Kickstarter account, and the Kickstarter account drew in like $200,000, and it blew away by like an order of magnitude everything that uh, ever, all the other projects that Kickstarter had, have ever hosted before. And so now these four guys are off in San Francisco basically trying to implement this thing. But that they're trying to implement essentially the uh, social networking component of that, which would be something that, y you know, I don't know. They're still trying to work it out. But basically, a service that runs on this runs on this embedded device that you would you would maintain control over, or ideally, and then um, you know gathers information from particular other nodes in a distributed manner that they that you have identified as nodes that you want to have communication with and who you want to share data with excuse me um, i think now would be uh, about sip and asterisk right this yeah. is super cool and super interesting but i'm just thinking maybe we should like uh, are we all agreeing that this is that we have uh, hijacked the I don't room? know. I was, or, uh, I, I was just doing it since the speaker never showed up. The speaker won't show up because he hasn't arrived at DevCon. Oh, so okay. he won't show up. Uh, so how about this? One of the things that he was proposing, talking about being on this device, was a SIP asterisk server. So clearly, hopefully people are in here in the room are interested in that topic. So Yeah. yeah. So um, maybe I can uh, jump in here. Uh, I, I missed the beginning of the discussion. So one of the things we wanted, uh, we had an informal buff after the session this morning, the presentation by Mogul, where we tried to coordinate a little uh, work team to work on that. And it by no means uh, uh, was meant to be restrictive or whatever. Uh, but we now have a wiki page on the Debian wiki that's called Freedom Box. So if people want to look it up, it's there. Uh, we wanted to organize a buff for this, but it seems that it's self-organized already, so that's <laughs> fine. Uh, so we can like talk about all this. Uh, but one of the things we have already done is try to come up with a mission statement uh, or a vision statement. So if people want to look it up right now, it, it also already has some good grounds. I can't read it uh, because I don't have it on my computer. But my point is uh, that the idea behind all this is to really create an integrated stack of software uh, with a common very easy to use interface that will allow to do multiple things, including VoIP, including email, including software lab, application services at home, and all this stuff. So for me, it's a very important project that I've already, already that I was already interested in. And for me, what uh, even has changed is that he's officially promoting it and getting people interested in the project which means that a lot of people are going to stop, well, not stop, but instead of just doing it all on their own in their basement, which I've been doing for the last 10 years, but they are going to stop sharing that expertise and creating a distribution that anybody can install on whatever machine, right? Like the Shiva plug is a good example because people can uh, relate to it more easily than installing a crappy old gray 
like 486 or Pentium or whatever it is now that is a crappy computer. Uh, so people can more easily like uh, relate to that. Um, but basically the idea is to create what we said earlier, like a, a, a custom Debian distribution or a bunch of meta packages that are going to bundle everything together for everyone to, to make it easy to install, easy to set up, easy to use. Hello. Yes. Did you want to? Did you want to describe? This is, I guess, an example of the form factor. This seems to have an actual LCD screen on it. Yeah. What? What is this exactly? Does somebody want to? Does somebody who knows what this is want to describe what Hello. it is? Hello. Yeah. This is a, a, a camera. Well, balloon board. Wait, uh, Wait. Let's get you a microphone. Uh, this is a balloon board. It's a, it's attached. It's well. It is a development platform. It's an ARM device. It has a, a PX save board. You can it, it's open, so you can show the the, Here, the I'm board. Gonna, can does it does this good for people? Can people look at this? Yeah. Can I pass it around? Yeah, you can pass it around. Be careful because the the board is it's loose. It's a little bit um, a little uh, bit not flaky, yeah. but here's one in a box. And then closed it, box. It has an L More L box. It has an LCD, and but this is a development platform we use, and uh, it could be like the Freedom Box or something like that. Just wanted to show, and there's some other devices people have, like uh, Efica MX or maybe you want to show or the only catch is it's actually quite hard to buy a balloon board you can ask us nicely and we'll keep not getting around to sending you one how similar is this to the uh, oh is that is this a similar device as well oh okay so that's an that's an Efficat MX which is a rather newer board it's Cortex A8 base so that's a modern ARM V7 current generation ARM how, how closely related are these to the Guru Plug? The, the Guru Plug is an ARM V6, so that's about in between, halfway. Uh, but it's, the Guru Plug's quite a lot faster. That's a gigahertz, I think. Um, so it's got, a, well, so, th yeah, the Efficam X has got quite a lot more welly than a balloon board has. But um, balloon board's got more uh, memory and flash on board. You know, you pay your money and takes your choice, right? There's an awful lot of these boards. Right. Uh, and so fundamentally, as you say, the hardware doesn't actually matter that much. Right. Uh, I think it's interesting that there's an LCD on that on the balloon board device, though. Is that just you can plug it into a TV version, we, or we've done a TV uh, ad, um, adapter board as well, so you can right. actually plug a good old-fashioned monitor in the back if you really right. want to. Um, it, the problem with that is that it uses almost all the memory bandwidth that's plating your screen, ah, so it's not yeah. really very useful. That seems limiting. So, getting back to the um, SIP telephony asterisk issue, was there another question? Yes. Comment? Go for it, Gunnar. Hang a second. There, you're nicely. <laughs> don't, no, don't move now. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. I want also to go back to the uh, the talk topic and, well, in any way, still related to this uh, presentation in in the morning. I think for most of us, well, we don't uh, really need much of a uh, Skype replacement because we have several. I mean. I, I use a Kiga on a frequent basis, and uh, I know that uh, although I haven't uh, success, uh, successfully used it, I know that Pigeon already supports uh, a voice as well. But uh, the problem here again is uh, the, the the end users, yes, uh, and not 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 so much in the in terms of a hard to use interface, but uh, as for network unfriendly protocols, which is quite a problem with uh, SIP. I, even more, with, uh, well, I, I often do video conferencing at my university. Uh, H323 really, 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 really sucks when, when used from a non-public non uh, IPs or so. And uh, well, uh, I have been trying to get some friendlier things to, uh, friendlier uh, programs, uh, standards, protocols that uh, my non-computer literate, uh, well, uh, let's say, clients ca can use to connect to participate, in not even in a one-to-one -one meeting, but a one-to-many, which is quite, uh, quite uh, problematic uh, with, with the applications we now have. We have something called OpenMCU, uh, which uh, well is a 
audio and video call multiplexer, which uh, is uh, packaged in, Debe in Debian. But uh, as far as I could uh, test it, it works fine when one person connects. It still works mostly when two people connect. But then a third person connects and it, uh, it dies. So, uh, I mean, clearly that it's no improvement uh, overall. And well, uh, I so I'm curious about what what's the interface meant to be for the for the phone part of this? Uh, well, the, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the problem is not the interface. The problem is that most uh, home users or most uh, small enterprises uh, will not have a full blown. Uh, a public IP, at least in my country, in many places uh, I've seen, you have uh, non-rotable networks uh, masqueraded. Or, uh, or, in, or, in, uh, or uh, yeah, but you, you can't control it. Yeah, IPv6 would be good, but uh, I cannot control what the provider gives uh, yeah, the, uh, co the customers. So one of the problems we have right now with SIP, and even, I don't know if uh, any of you here run a SIP server at home? One, people, two, uh, a few, okay. So uh, you probably experimented with the various uh, problems related to um, NAT and firewalls and all this stuff. SIP isn't designed to deal with heterogeneous networks and stuff like that. So uh, one of the things I think, one of the objectives of the SIP Witch project is, is to work around those issues, the routing problems we have on the internet due to censorship, due to uh, restrictive ISPs that break our networks and things like that. Uh, well from our understanding, the other uh, objective of the project is also to provide cryptography and security and confidentiality to the calls because SIP, as it is right now, is completely in the clear, has no security whatsoever, and there are extensions to try to fix that, but it's always layers of um, crap over existing craps, <laughs> basically. So it's, it's, it's always something that's much harder to adopt um, than if you start from scratch and say, okay, we're gonna like replace Skype. And uh, I agree that I personally don't use Skype, but I would really appreciate having that decentralized network available for me to work my way around restrictions. Right now, if I want to create a, do a SIP connection here, I don't know if I'll, if I'll be able to because there's maybe a NAT, maybe there's some policies here that make it impossible to do that. So I think there is a requirement, there is a need for such a software to be available. And I think in general, one of the ideas behind the Freedom Box too is to have all the services we have decentralized and secure so that we, we bring back the original ideas of having a secure network and a decentralized network at all parts of the infrastructure. Not only like, well, I was about to say, not only email, but even email is not secure, right? Because we don't, we don't encrypt our emails, we rely on, on like cra the crappy security email provides. So if we try to uh, provide tools for people that bundle all those secure alternatives, then people are gonna start using them because, not because they're worried about their privacy, because obviously they don't worry enough to change their habits, but because it's cool or it's the latest thing or it's, you know, bringing back like a, a better tool to, as he was saying, like replace your wireless router with this little cool gizmo with a, with a monkey on it or whatever. <laughs> because these, they've got LCDs now, which the, the guru plug doesn't have, and I think the LCD can go a long way. And I think you have a very valid point about the interface. Like a phone is a very simple user interface, and when it got in, when it started, people started using it, some people weren't able to use it because they couldn't remember the phone numbers, they couldn't know how to type it in there. It's not necessarily an intuitive interface. We consider it intuitive because we're born with it and we've been taught how to use it. But a phone already isn't quite uh, Yeah, I mean, you're easy. talking about, you know, I, well, if, you, if people could remember the IPv6 addresses of their friends or something like that, then it wouldn't. Exactly, you, you know. Type it in, but so when we talk about that. SIP, we talk about email addresses. We talk about something already much more complicated than phones. And if we were talking about an interface, then we, it means that we need to have either a, a phone device that you pull to your ear, ear or something. But you still need to know. You still need to figure out how how to dial the person you're going to dial. Right? Exactly. That's that requires some screen or something. So one of, the, one, one of the things he was talking about was to have 
a cell phone connecting to your device, so that instead of relying on the device itself doing everything, the device is kind of a focal point. Uh, it's, a, it's a server right. that you have multiple clients attached to it. Yeah, when you're away from your home, you would connect to your home to get back to other people. Yeah, yeah I think to follow up on that, that's, I think, highlights a key point about the Freedom Box idea is that it's not going to be your phone, it's going to be your phone server. And things like Android phones, like Mamo, Mi, whatever it's called now, Migo phones have VoIP built in. It, I mean, there is still the problem of what you're talking about that SIP kind of sucks over the internet and Skype has done a really good job of like penetrating all that. But it's, there was a lot of discussion about the interface and like this thing is kind of in the middle. It's like, it's like your email box. It's your, it's your phone server. It's your Facebook server. Uh, it's not the interface to your Facebook. It's not the interface to your phone. It's not the interface to your mail. That you can use other things. So the, one of the things that um, worries me about the situation is that most of these services that we rely on right now, we work because, they're, cause, because of high availability, right? We rely on email services and phone services that are essentially always on, right? But I don't know about you guys, but my home network is flaky as all hell. And, it, and it's supposed to be, you know, I, from Time Warner, it's not, it's not a sophisticated business thing, but, you know, if I'm, if, in order for this device to work as advertised, you need a good, reliable net connection. So that's gonna be, that's, I think, gonna be the hardest thing to overcome since we're not gonna be in control of that at all. And Evan was, you know, he was pretty adamant that sort of if we build it, they will come sort of attitude. And if we build it, we can, for, we can push them to do things, them being all the other things that we don't control. But, you know, there's some pretty big challenges there, especially since we're one of the big people that we're going to be fighting against is our upstream providers who are not going to be necessarily happy about this or into it, you know, in whatever form it takes. But, you know, like the point, there was a question raised about, you know, ports, that ISPs usually block a whole bunch of stuff that, that they don't want people to bring stuff from. So, I mean, when I first moved to New York, I had an unbelievable battle with Verizon because they just flat out denied that they were blocking port 80 from my apartment. And I was like, you guys are a pack of liars. And they just said, no, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. You're fucking lying to me. I can't believe you're lying to me. And I finally got to like some upper manager after like three days and they said, oh yeah, we're blocked. <laughs> Fuck you. You just, like I just spent three days on the phone battling you about this and they wouldn't even admit that they were doing it. So I don't, I don't know how we're going to necessarily overcome that sort of thing because that stuff's going to have to be dealt with for any of this to work as, as he's outlined it. I just uh, wanted to go back to the comment um, <laughs> regarding remembering your buddy's uh, IPv6 address um, because I think for any technology to really be uh, successful, um, it, it's can, the reason that cell phones have taken over and smartphones and things like that is because they're extremely convenient that they, they basically decrease cognitive dissonance. And I think we may find ourselves getting into, uh, you know, IETF, RFCs and stuff because what it seems like what you really want is you want an ID I know this guy, he's tmansel at debian.org, um, and there's a DNS server that, that has a lot of things on it, including um, something encrypted. Webfinger. That's just me. I just thought of that. Okay. You guys heard about this Webfinger thing that people yes. are talking about? Okay. So is, does it include some way where I can um, encrypt with all of my friends? Closer to your mouth. Public keys. Thank you. <laughs> so that, because what I want to do, I want to put a lot of information about myself out there, but I only want folks whom I know to be able to get to it, at, at, and not including Zuckerberg from uh, yeah, the, the, Facebook. In fact, actually, some people that I work with have been talking to the diaspora folks about that exact issue, actually. How to use public key cryptography to make sure that those those like point-to-point -point connections are, are secure and authenticated and that sort of thing. I have I have another thing to throw into this whole puzzle, uh, which is uh, when we're talking SIP, as I guess some of us here <laughs> is interested in, 
um, is the latency problem. Because one of the things that I fear the, that upstreams will fight us with is to optimize even more aggressively for bandwidth, which means that we, it kills the latency so that we cannot do uh, interactive. What, I, what, I, what we have today in Denmark is that the biggest provider is providing this little uh, um, five-port uh, Ethernet box with direct ADS, uh, DSL inside it, so you have to do their box. You cannot open it. You don't know the password for their DSL co uh, encryption. And this box, one of the ports, if you pay for it, has uh, optimizing for, uh, for latency so that you can use it for VoIP. And the other ones do not, uh, and things like that. So you have provided their phone connection. It's a phone provider. They also sell DSL li lines, but then they d deliberately lower the latency of the other ports. So what I could imagine that is easily done for them is to just <coughs> make it clutter so that you always get a delay long enough that you don't want to use it for SIP. Yeah, especially if they're trying to sell you phone service. <laughs> exactly. So I wanted to comment uh, quickly on two things. Uh, the first one is uh, the question of identity, basically, what you were raising, like I uh, touched on earlier. For me, um, phone numbers are going down the drain, in my mind. Uh, email addresses are way easier to remember and um, uh, have actual meaning. Uh, and work already, they're used for SIP, they're used for email, you can use the domain part for a website, like it makes sense. Uh, so that can already be used. So for me that problem is technically resolved. It's not a technical problem, it's a, it's a social, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of who owns the domain names, who well, manages all this stuff. I feel like there's a little bit of a technical challenge there, but that, the, who knows about Webfinger? Who's heard about Webfinger? Oh wow, surprisingly few people. I thought I was a late comer to this. Fof? Oh, it's the same thing? I don't know. Who, who knows do about Fof? Not that many more. <laughs> but I, so briefly what the idea with Webfinger is, from what I understand, is that basically email addresses become uh, resolvable. Like they, they become uh, something like a DNS record where you can, using somebody's email address, you can find out information about the sort of services that person provides on the net. Maybe somebody who knows about it more can correct me if I'm wrong. Just, 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 I'll edit a small thing. The way I understand it, Webfinger is a, li a slightly distortion or a different approach to the same as Fof plus SSL, which is the inventor of the, uh, of the web who is now working on the extension of using the HTTP layer itself. So it's not email addresses, it's web addresses, uh, it's URLs. Right. So it's, it's a web address which then you tag as also being your identity. Right, but you have to somehow resolve the, 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 web, the email address to a yes, number or to a URL. Yes, and that is the reason I, I, I mentioned both friend of a friend network. So the networking relationship and the linking into email addresses and other uh, resources on right. the internet is done through the, the RDF. Uh, data yeah, well, this so sort of sounds like a panacea to a lot of these these issues about identifying where your friends are on the web, right? As long as you know somebody's email address and you can web finger that email address and figure out where their, you know, where their freedom box is and that sort of thing, then it makes that a lot easier. So if you want to make phone calls or whatever. Is there a microphone on this side? Oh, yeah, go ahead. You, yeah. Um, in reference to what you mentioned before in terms of uh, Verizon that provide fighting with Verizon, Verizon is hell. So basically, yeah, no, uh, unless you're uh, going to go through an ISP that's going to deal with Verizon for you, which, I had to do, which I've done before, um, you're probably going to have to go to DSL reports and do a search for a provider that's going to give you service. Cable service sucks, but if you, if you want to have your ports open, you, have to, you probably would have to go with DSL. Um, I that used, used to, to be Speakeasy, but as no, Evan there pointed there out. There are lots of different companies. I, yeah. I've never used Speakeasy. I used, um, for a long time, I used Cyberonic. They're located in Boston. Um, their DHCP service, you can get 6 down and 768 up, so you can get higher service, but it's, uh, it's going to be a little uh, yeah, more costly. Like okay. Well, yeah, he was speaking about Verizon, so, uh, yeah, and that's, that's the thing that came to me. Yeah, it's, a, it's an example. And um, so basically, they don't block your ports. 
uh, you have less chances of, of having these independent companies not blocking your port than these large corporations in terms of Quest, Verizon, Comcast, who have a tendency to want to block ports because they're, they're also irresponsible people running uh, applications, to things that they're trying or misconfiguring uh, web servers or um, especially mail servers. That's why they usually uh, block mail ports. Example, so that could be uh, wh what I wanted to say to him is that if, if, you want to, if we want to circumvent, as I, I'm going to speak about the U.S. because that's what I'm most familiar with, if you want to circumvent uh, certain vendors like Verizon, you might want to, go, you might want to look for smaller companies which are, which are going to give you the service between $40 and $100. You're going to pay more than cable, but you're going to be able to use all your ports and do everything. There's no limitation as far as I've, I've used with them, and I've had them for years. No limitation whatsoever. You can run any server you want. Yeah, was, so yes, that, that's true, but it also makes it, the adoption issue is harder. If you yeah. want to get adoption, you, you, it's harder to say, oh, buy this box and, and find yeah. a service provider that does this. Here's, you know, here's a list, but, uh, oh, and you're going to pay twice as yeah. much. And, you know, those are all difficult Because things. of the, 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 coalesc the coalescing of services with these large companies that are buying up smaller companies. And so you have Time Warner. Time Warner doesn't allow... Uh, cable vision, for example, to get into their, their zone. So there's no need for competition. They don't need to improve service at all. Uh, Verizon has their own stuff. And then, you know, it's, right. yeah, it's so become very difficult. Basically, those are social political problems. They're, they're not, as I said, my, my first point was that the identity problem was not really a technical problem. We have a lot of solutions. It's mostly a matter of adoption. And I think that the, the fight for network neutrality, which is what we're talking about here, uh, goes beyond just which provider you choose or which port is blocked or how they fuck with your latency and all this stuff. Um, as long as we're just a bunch of geeks that want to play with asterisk at home, they're not going to bother. Nothing's going to change. When, when we have the freedom box, when we start operating those, those, those systems, then we have leverage. Then we have leverage to start asking for things saying, people want to own their own infrastructure. People want to operate their own services at home, and this is legitimate. This is not just a bunch of geeks in their basement. That everybody uses them. Everybody tries that. And some providers do it, but they're getting rammed down by Verizon or by, by Deutsche Telekom or by whatever company out there, right? So the idea is to have leverage. The idea is to have a good use case or on, on, on how the internet should be, because a lot of people that make those policy decisions figure that the internet is like a television or a series of tube or whatever that like, you just sit in front of and you get fed stuff, right? That's a lot of the vision that's, uh, that's in public administration and that's, that's partly true to some extent. Like the way Amazon or Google or a lot of companies operate on the network is that they build those gigantic websites and those huge data centers and they own the data and they push it to you. And you give them a little well, a lot of your personal information, but then they own it, and then they push it back to you. And it's the same way that happened with television or radio back then, is that companies own the network, and they own the data, and they own the information, and we need, and by changing that, then we start talking about the rules and why we want to change the rules, and that's why this whole thing is interesting. I think that as long as we just say, oh, they're blocking my ports, that's too bad, or I'm gonna change providers, like, some countries in the world right now have 100 megabit at home and don't have those kind of problems, right? Um, we need to demand better services, right? This is ridiculous right now. We're completely capable of offering proper co internet connectivity at home and we're not doing it because those companies are in the conflict of interest. There used to be laws against that, against monopolies. AT&T was broken up back then and it's reunifying everything. So those things are policy decisions that are made at a higher level in every country in the world right now and those things are things that can change and having proper lever leverage for that will help. Um, uh, yeah, going back to the identity issue, it seemed to me, I was thinking about this earlier, as several of us have been, um, you've got, if, if, if you've got a dynamic IP, which I imagine most people have, you've got to have some way of being able to get that information out onto the net. I don't know if this both thing helps, because I don't know anything about it, but it seems to me that it, it's impossible not to rely on some external service in order to broadcast your IP address, at least, 
so that you can get back to the box to say this is the box responsible for this particular identity and therefore the authentication of, of whatever services are provided. Um, and, the, and, and then the question arises, what is that service? You know, we're going we're to use dindianes.org for this? They're tiresome people. I, clearly um, we need IPv6 now. <laughs> does that solve that problem? I think so. Why, well, why you don't need... It, it's Because it's you don't need to have a dynamic IP address with IPv6. I mean, if you don't have to yeah, have, if your IP address is not dynamic, then it's not an issue. You just, pub, you just publish, you just publish the mapping from your web, your email address or your URL to okay. your IP address, and then people know where to find you, right? That's great if it works, but I, I suspect we're going to have a transition period where, well, in practice, yeah, we haven't got that, and we're going to have to. I, okay, I guess if it's only a transition, that's cool. We'll just have to put up with some uh, intermediary for a time, but eventually, well, you Debian's can get rid of that. pushing IPv6. It l at least as well as anybody else is, maybe better. So obviously we're in a position to push that forward more. Lots. I wanted to kind of bring it back to, I guess, what's on the subject of this talk, which is replacing, <laughs> uh, which is replacing um, Skype. And Skype actually is actually, for what more of the ISP discussion that we just had, is a really good model. Um, as far as I know, no ISPs have kicked people out for using Skype. Skype is a peer-to-peer -peer service. It is serving. It is, Skype is like many network administrators hate it because it looks for any open port and it just it doesn't obey the rules of, you know, this port does this service. It just is like, I'm going to do whatever I can to get a working phone call. So we can do that as well. And when you look at ISPs have contract. So this is something I think it applies in most of the world. I don't know about it. But the, the contracts say you can't do this. So if you violate the contract, they terminate it. Maybe they fine you. You don't get arrested. I don't think there's many places in the world right now yet, but I don't think there's many places in the world where you'll be arrested or really much punished for violating the terms of your ISP uh, terms of service. So I'm, I, don't, I don't feel like that's the worry, though, right? I mean, just well, having your service terminated is bad enough, I think, to... to there are, uh, if you have no other options, yes. I mean, if, if, if plugging in this device got your service terminated in a couple of days because it was doing something again against your ISP terms right, of so service... Right, so we go back to Skype. Does, has any ISP terminated service because of Skype? Skype abuses... That's true. I just, Skype no, is I, serving. Skype is abusing a lot of rules. Yeah. Okay, most of the world, I don't think so. Yes, I don't, I don't know um, if uh, who here has actually studied how it is that Skype works. It's not quite correct to say that Skype is peer-to-peer. -peer. It can be peer-to-peer. -peer. Most of the time, it's peer-to-proxy. And um, so I'm, I'm leery of any suggestion that uh, relies upon some external thing like you know, when the great pumpkin comes and IPv6 is available. So, um, <clears throat> you know, how long have we been hearing about that one? So, uh, I mean, the the seems like the key elements are you know, like a distributed hash table with supersedes, which is the way that Skype works, is that there's a set of known hosts that are guaranteed to be on, and a community could provide those. Uh, and then, you know, you basically when your box logs on, if you have something that's not um, uh, uh, a nasty, you know, blocked port or something, and you basically you just sort of set yourself up as something like a secondary, and then it just goes from there. Either you try to find out the address from a, a super or one of the cached secondaries, and then off you go. Um, so it seems like that, in combination with some of the work that uh, Dan Bornstein has been doing with high-speed cryptography. I don't know if anyone has looked at DNS curve at all. Um, looks like some very interesting stuff. So I think a hybrid of some of what uh, uh, Dan has been doing with the basic idea of the distributed hash table and the peer-to-peer, -peer, if possible, but typical case peer-to-proxy, could, could actually be quite viable. Apparently we only have 10 more minutes left of this lecture. Hello. Yes. Yeah, there's a question. Well, we've been debating on IRC as well. And there's a question from Timo Linford, Lin, Timo Linford from Finland. 
Awesome. And do you really think IP version 6 is going to help with NAT firewall problems? And if it does, what about mobile IP? Moving around and using wire wireless LANs with your PDA? And going I, I through. I certainly can't answer that question. I, I, get, I, get, I, I think that no, NAT is a. It's, is not, a it's not a question for you, it's just yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah. for the audience. And, of course. And also, you, you have to go through all these firewalls and right. all these things. It may be useful to design some kind of library or something that, that can get through right. all this. Uh, well, certainly, the point of IPv6 is that we, don't, ha we don't have NAT anymore, right? That's, that's sort of like baseline point of IPv6, is that we don't have to deal with NAT. But firewalls, I think, you still have to deal with. Go ahead. Is the light on at the bottom? Hold, hold down the button. I just, I just wanted to uh, reiterate something that uh, was said this morning, and that is you know, th the target audience of this project is really not geeks, because many of us in this room can already do this. And so, um, we need to make sure that this is familiar and usable by people on average ISPs with average connections. And it's only by being usable with what people have now that will gain the leverage to be able to change things. So we have to make sure that, for instance, if the average person wants to use uh, um, a device to be able to make calls to people that don't have VOIP or don't have a Freedom Box, that uh, we can provide some sort of interface to do that, maybe w through one of any number of SIP providers out there or, or whatever else if SIP doesn't work. But uh, similarly, um, we need to make it easy and with something that they can understand right now. One, one example would be you can get an analog telephone adapter. You could, uh, they're, they're less than 100 bucks. You can plug a regular, any old fashioned phone into it. There's your interface. Um, you know, more expensive than the Except for the phone. dial pad part, right? That's what I was worried about before. You can't, I mean, yeah. if you don't know where your, your friends, if you don't know what their friend's IPv6 address is or whatever their, whatever their internet address is, it's hard to dial it in. So you need to have something to right. if, if you're push gonna a button call to call over somebody. There. Yeah, you, you need some uh, mapping. If, if you're going to call over the internet, some way to uh, let them punch in a phone number or something. But I think that a lot of people are going to want to not just talk to other people with a freedom box. And uh, so what can we do to make, uh, to make this exciting for that kind of person too? And can we um, let these third party vendors that uh, do SIP termination get involved and uh, have a, a marketplace or something out there? So I wanted to answer the RSC question. Um, I think regarding IPv6, it's just one of the pieces in the puzzle. I don't think it's going to solve any, all the problems. Uh, people always make fun of IPv6 as coming real soon now. But actually, IPv4 is going away now. That's what's happening. We're running out of IPs, right? This is going to happen in one or two years now. It's a very clear and present danger, and it's going to change a lot of the things that are possible right now. Right now, you can just get a server, get an IP, it's cheap. An, an IP is cheap right now. You get an IP at home. You get usually a real IP at home. You're usually not netted, at least in North America, as far as I know. There are some that do it now. So that's changed already from my perspective. So those things are going to change. So we're, we are going to require some change in infra infrastructure. And the reason why we talk about IPv6 is not because we're geeks that want to play around with little toys. It's because we're technologists, we're scientists, we're people that actually build the infrastructure. We're the people that are building the, the future technology. And if we keep on doing the right thing, then the right thing may happen, right? We, ne we need to stop, like, whipping ourselves and saying like, oh, we suck, or this is not even never gonna happen. We need to start building those things. And I think I, it, it's cheesy to say that, but we need to just do it. And I, I think it, if we build it, yes, they will come. And I think w the, the Freedom Box is exactly that. It's one of those tools that we're, we're gonna build on. The, uh, the thing that was mentioned about mobile IPs, is, uh, for me, is missing the point. Uh, of course, phones are becoming more and more powerful, and they're becoming general purpose computers, but they're always computers. You don't host a server on your laptop. You can, but it's, 
it's just a tool. You, you, you don't host, I don't host my personal emails on my laptop because it's moving all the time, it's not convenient. And if I lose my laptop, then I lose my emails. So my emails are at home. So my IP is at home. It may change, that doesn't matter. I used to be on, on the dynamic IP for a long time with DNS, it was working fine. I changed just because it was more convenient. And I, it's actually a more security problem to have a s static IP. So I'm thinking of changing back, but my IP is kind of cute, so I keep it. <laughs> but basically, like, this is irrelevant. This is all like very simple technological problem we need to solve. And what we need is to have the proper leverage, the proper tools to offer people so they can start playing with new, to new tools, new toys that anybody can use. And to have those cute things that people want. The new Gmail, like Gmail at home, it's better than Gmail, it's your email. You can offer a Gmail to a friend, right? You can offer a phone number to a friend. You can provide a gateway to a phone system, to the phone system to your friends because you have a phone line at home and you hook up the Shiva plug to it and then boom, you, you're a gateway to the traditional phone system, right? And until it dies. But this is all stuff that's doable right now. This is stuff I've been doing for a while, and this is stuff that everybody here has been playing with. It's just that we need to start sharing it instead of like acting like basement geeks and like, ah, I got the VoIP working now. We need to share this stuff now. We need to share this stuff and make it accessible to everybody. That's the real concern we have right now. And if we stay in our basement, then we're gonna stay in our basement. We need to get out. Yeah, I agree, you're here. <coughs> So I think that's probably as good a place to stop as any. 